so the last time you guys saw Brink, of course, um, at previous press events and stuff, what we showed was the big kind of uh, single player experience with a little bit of co-op. Uh, really just giving people a sense of how cinematic the game is and some of things like smart movement controls and so on. Uh, but with this E3, what we really wanted to do was show people what it was like once you'd been leveling up, once you'd been playing the game for a while. So it's a brand new experience. We're showing things from the Resistance perspective. Of course, you can play through the game not just as security, but the Resistance too. We're showing a brand new map reactor where you're going on a, on a big destruction mission as part of the Resistance force. And also we're showing a whole bunch of new customization options, not just character customization that people have seen in the past, which was, you know, the character customization interface where you had that linear list. That's now in 3D. You can manipulate the character, zoom in in all kinds of components and do things like scars and tattoos and face paint and body outfits and so on. We've also got a brand new weapon customization system as well that lets you drill in on each of the components of the weapons and make modifications to them. And then of course our, our ability system, which allows you to level up your character by getting new skills, tools and gadgets. Since last year's E3, our real focus has been on game balance and general polish. So in terms of project status, we're around alpha now. Uh, the game's playing really well. We're here at E3 for the first time with a full hands-on on the PlayStation 3. So people can just turn up and play. And we have full drop in and out support for up to seven of your friends to join you. So on the E3 stand, as we're playing right now, we can have one person just in a map playing solo, single player. Somebody else turns up, they can jump into that same game with their outfits, their customization options, their cool weapons and abilities and join in that same game experience. So I suppose the thing that sets Brink apart really is that um, probably two or three different things. Of course, the universe is great. We have a very distinct art style for what is essentially uh, the Ark. It's an immense artificial floating city uh, built at sea as part of a contemporary green vision. But you enter the game universe around 2045. It's lost contact with the rest of the Earth and it's become the focus of these uh, competing factions who are really experiencing an isolated and horrific conflict. Uh, as you enter the game, you're able to use a brand new system of movement called SMART. It stands for Smooth Movement Across Random Terrain. And the idea is pretty straightforward, really. In shooters, we've always had these kind of artificial and frustrating constraints. You know, where I run up to a table and, you know, it's two inches too high, so I can't jump onto it, or I can't slide under it, or a wall that I can't climb over. And these are all things that, you know, we could do in real life, even if we're not super fit soldiers, so it seems odd that you can't do them in video games. So we've taken those artificial and frustrating constraints out. And with our new system, SMART, you're able to just use a single button to do things like vaults and slides and mantles and climbs and so on. Well, as you play through the game, you advance your same in-game character, irrespective of whether you're playing offline or online. So you play as part of a coordinated squad. You take on a combat role that suits your preferred playing style. If you want to be, you know, the one that runs and guns, you could play soldier, you know, destroying objectives and giving out ammunition. Or if you want a more supporting role, you could play engineer, deploying defense turrets, letting the turrets do the shooting for you, and just planting landmines and defending an area that you're trying to control. But as you do so, you're with this kind of coordinated squad trying to pull off these big military objectives, and you earn experience points for all the things you do that kind of aid your squad mates, and you can spend these experience points on cool upgrades, things like new outfits and new gear, uh, weapon unlocks and upgrades and modifications, new tools, items and uh, skills for your player. Well, it doesn't matter whether you're playing single player or cooperative or competitive, you advance your same persistent in-game character as you play. Now, in terms of like uh, character customization, I suppose the main thing is that we know that when you give someone some, uh, a reward that's purely aesthetic, it needs to be something that reflects their status. So in our game, you get outfits for things like leveling up. And as you level up, it represents to other players that if you're wearing that really badass gear, then they must be a pretty cool player. They've achieved some special things. So that's the first part of it. The second thing is that you get lots of opportunities to see yourself in third person. Your character is part of the cinematics for the opening of all of the maps and the missions and things that you go on. When you complete objectives, you can get cool abilities like a sense of perspective, which lets you drop into a third person camera so you can see yourself completing objectives and also keep an eye out for enemies and stuff while you're doing that. And then finally, of course, it's just the fact that your friends when you're playing online can see that you've got this really cool gear that you've customized. So you've got a unique look for yourself. And we think it's really important that, you know, when you play through a single player experience when you get to the end of it if you then go and play online uh, in many of our past games you know that was pretty much the end of that character where well, you've invested loads of hours in it so we want you to be able to carry that stuff forward to take that same character that you've really developed and everything playing solo and use that same character when you're playing cooperatively or competitively i guess the thing about uh, character classes in brink 
Really, what these combat roles allow you to do is to play the game the way that you like to play. Some people, you know, have a cracking aim and they like to be the guy on the front line pulling off, you know, perfect mid-air headshots and stuff. But there are other players that are much better tactically. You know, they're better at putting down defense turrets, planting landmines, uh, buffing other people's weapons and supporting the team as they move forward. Other players like to play a more stealthy role so they could play operative, you know, sneaking behind enemy lines, uh, disguising themselves as the enemy, getting into their base, hacking into computers, opening back doors and trying to avoid being discovered. It's actually just as easy to level up and play through the game without firing a single shot as it is to be the best shot on the server, you know, the best shot on, uh, uh, of all the people that are playing. And that's really important to us because, you know, in combat, just like in American football or, or British soccer, there are different positions that have different combat roles or that have different sporting roles where if you coordinate together as a team, you're much more effective. So when it comes to the art style for the game, really what we did quite early on was hire a brand new art director. His name's Olivier Leonardi. He's the guy that was the art director behind uh, Prince of Persia and uh, Rainbow Six Vegas. And he wanted to bring an art style to the game that was really unique, that was really kind of characteristic, that would give us a universe where, you know, if you see a screenshot or you see uh, some gameplay footage or a trailer or a poster, you just know it's Brink straight away. And we wanted to just have something that was a little bit different, you know, not just another shooter in North Africa or in an airbase or on a, an aircraft carrier or whatever that had a kind of distinct uh, a world that you hadn't seen before. So what Olivier's been able to do is really unify the way that the environment looks and the way that the characters look to just give Brink a, a visual style that's quite compelling. Now, of course, with, uh, with visual arts of all types, once you decide to be stylistic, you know, they're different things to different people. But I think it's a little bit like good music, you know? If you, if you listen to a really cool pop song, it's great for a couple of days and then you get sick of it really fast. But when you get a really good music album, something that you know you're gonna love forever, you can just listen to it over and over again, but it takes a little bit more time to appreciate it. And I think stylistic art direction is one of those things where, you know, it can be a little bit difficult at first when you're working out ideas and stuff. Olivia and I certainly argued a lot in the early stages. He has, um, I did a developer diary for Bethesda Softworks and and in the developer diary, I admitted that Olivier had been right all along. So Steve Gaffney, our studio director, printed it out on A3 paper and stuck it on the back of Olivier's screen. So if you walk through the development floor now, there's a sign there that says Olivier was right all along, Paul Wedgwood and the quote and the date that I said it. So I'm really pleased with the way that it's come out and the way that the game looks. Okay, so we're just going to move on to our reader questions section. And the first question is, is there an online ranking system for Brink? Right. Well, you know, we... Um, uh, at Splash Damage, we've been developing multiplayer titles for about 10 years now. Our first game, Wolfenstein Enemy Territory, was released back in the summer of 2003. We've had around 15 million downloads of that game, over half a billion matches played online. So when we started work on Enemy Territory Quake Wars, we knew that we wanted to have a really big statistics back-end, really great online services for the game. And we were one of the first companies to really start doing that with shooters and having that kind of presence and everything for a multiplayer shooter. For Brink right now, in terms of project status, we're about we're around alpha, so we're not really ready, ready yet to start talking about what the online services offering is going to be, but obviously we have really big plans because the game is one that blurs the lines between offline gaming and online gaming. Um, as far as that's concerned, though, I think uh, gamers are in pretty good hands. The second question is, can you tell us about the parkour system in the game? That's obviously smart, so if you just want to recap. So we hired a great technical designer called Aubrey Hesselgren, uh, as well as being a, a, a guy who prototypes um, a game code and writes design documentation, he was a parkour enthusiast. He was actually on the Jump London DVD, one of the first kind of uh, documentaries that popularised uh, parkour. He um, uh, started work on the freedom of movement system for us, just completely coincidentally. We knew we wanted to do freedom of movement and we managed to find him, so it was a great kind of outcome. He did some crazy things like stuffing, uh, uh, strapping cameras to his head and running around his parents' farm and jumping off of walls and, and getting punched in the face by his dad and all kinds of stuff just to get a sense of how stuff would look. But we're very aware of the fact that it's not, it's not great to have a camera that kind of takes away from the player experience. Even if it looks really realistic, it can be unnerving and, and, and poor for player control. So our smart system isn't an autopilot. It doesn't take over control from you at any point. It's always the case that you're in complete control of it and that you're the one making the decision about what you do, just like hitting a jump button on a controller. Essentially, our smart button doubles up as our sprint button, so when you're not doing any smart moves, you'll just use it to sprint around. But if you approach something like a table, you can use it to vault and then slide across the table. If you run up to something that you could climb up, you can mantle up and over the top of something. If you look down at something, you can slide under, you can slide under 
a surface as well. So what it does in essence is kind of intuitively understand the context of where you are, the, uh, the many opportunities around you, and let you do those things. But because it doesn't take over your control, you can do cool combos. So I can launch myself off the top of a container, and just before I hit the ground, hit crouch, I'll go into a slide, and then I can spin sideways and start shooting at people at the same time. 